Okay, so it is on. These are very tall chairs, by the way. Yes. Um, so this is my solo panel, so you're stuck with me. Uh, usually what I like to do is, is just take a couple of minutes to tell you guys about myself and uh, how I got started and uh, some of the things that I've done and then open it up to you guys for questions so that you can ask anything that you want to know. That sounds okay. Uh, so my name is Kari, like Ferrari, Walgren, and um, I have been doing voiceovers for, well, for a for a hundred years, no, <laughs> not that long, but for a while. Um, I grew up in Kansas, and I was doing theater and singing there, and, uh, and I always loved cartoons. Like I was always, you know, watching the Disney cartoons when I was young, and then when I got a little bit older, I was watching Batman the Animated Series, which really influenced me, and then I got a little older, and I, I would watch Dragon Ball Z and uh, Eon Flux in college, and and I always kind of knew that somebody was doing the voices behind those cartoons. And I thought, man, one day, no matter what else I'm doing, I want to be doing voices for the cartoons. So I moved out to Los Angeles, and I was doing survival jobs, and, uh, and there was this ad in the actor's paper <laughs> at the time, uh, and it said that they were auditioning for this cartoon. And so I went and I auditioned, and they said, hey, you know, you're really great. We'd like to bring you back for a second audition. Uh, we're going to send you home with this VHS tape. Yes, children, this is back in the days of VHS. <laughs> so they sent me home with this VHS tape, and they said, you're not going to understand what's going on because the whole thing is in Japanese. But we want you to just kind of watch it and see if you can kind of get the sound and the, the vibe of this character. So I'm watching this tape and this, this weird chick comes riding in on a Vespa and starts hitting this kid with a guitar and going, and I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. But I thought, okay, well, she sounds like this and this is happening. So I went and I did the second audition and I booked the role of Haruko in FLCL. And that was my very first uh, animation slash anime job in LA. And uh, from there, I went on to do a lot of other anime roles. I, I was Fu in Samurai Champloo. I was uh, Robin in Witch Hunter Robin, uh, Saya and Diva in Blood Plus, uh, Kagami and Lucky Star Saber in Face Day Night. Thank you. Oh, I love it. I'm getting even more fears. Um, so, uh, and then I started doing some video games, and I started doing uh, more US animation. So. I, I've done uh, RNA and Final Fantasy XV. I'm the uh, thank you. I'm the uh, female Jedi Knight in the Star Wars Old Republic game. Uh, Rain in Tales of Symphonia. Um, Vex in Skyrim. Proctor Ingram in uh, Fallout 4. And uh, and then as far as U.S. cartoons, I, I do Rick and Morty. I'm the voice of. Uh, Jessica and Rick's spaceship in Rick and Morty. I do Chandra Jimenez in Gravity Falls. I'm Starfire in the Teen Titans movies. Um, <coughs> uh, little Su Susie on Phineas and Ferb. So I do a, n a number of cartoons like that. And, and uh, so that's kind of what I do. And that's how I got started. And, um, and now I sometimes go to conventions and get to meet you guys. And uh, I talk with you a little bit. So um, that's kind of how I got my start. I don't know if you guys wanted to start asking some questions or I can just keep telling you stories from my side. I'm seeing a couple questions popping up here. So I guess, yeah, let's go ahead and let's go for it. Right, right here. Uh, hello, K uh, Kari or Kari as I Kari like Kari. Ferrari. Yeah. You had it, yeah. So I'm looking at your filmography and I noticed that you voiced it Nova in Super Robot Monkey Team Hyperforce Go. Oh yes. my god, so many people like feel like did that show ever existed? I mean like <laughs> how can people forget that one? You know what? The, there's a great story behind that. That was my first US animation series that I booked. It was through Disney. And the funny thing was I showed up for the first recording session for that show and one of the creators was wearing an FLCL t-shirt and I said hey I don't know if you know this but I did the voice of that 
and his eyes got huge and he's like, oh my gosh, this totally inspired the show. So even though that was a US animation show, it was inspired by anime. So it was kind of a cool full circle kind of thing. So yeah, that show, I, I still get a lot of letters about that and, and uh, who knows, maybe someday it'll come back because we had a great time on that one. Thank you. Hi, I had a question. Um, so, when you first started and, and you had your first gig, how did you audition? Like now in the industry, I guess things have changed. But is there like for people who have never auditioned before, do they have demo tapes? How, how exactly does the does that work? It you know it has changed a lot. Um, demos are still very important for people that eventually do voiceover. You know as more than just a hobby. But here's my big thing. Is there anybody out here that's thinking, oh, I might like to do some voice acting someday? Okay. So I want you to repeat after me. A bad demo. A bad demo. Is worse. Is worse. Than no demo at all. Than no demo at all. Okay. No. So the, this is the most crucial, important piece of advice that I can give you guys. Um, it's like if you go out on a date and you sit across from somebody and you're like, man, this could be awesome, this could go really well, and then they open their mouth and they say something really, really stupid, and you're like, oh, darn, so much potential. If you have a bad demo, nothing says more quickly, this person's not ready, than, than that demo. So what you really want to make sure you do is to take some classes, to do some coaching, uh, record yourself on tape and really kind of figure out what your strengths are before you put that demo together. Because it can actually hurt you if you put the demo together before you're ready to book jobs. Um, once you are ready, you know, make sure that the demo is short. Don't make it too long. You can keep it under a minute and a half, that's perfect. And uh, from there, the, the industry has changed a lot, so now there are websites where you can put your demo up and you can get hired from that. Agents can find you through that. Um, but there are also, there's so many things happening before that. Like, if you're in college, look into your campus radio stations because getting, uh, getting experience in a studio or getting some experience behind a microphone there's a real technical element to voiceover. You know, you, you want to make sure that you're not popping your peas all the time. You know, there's like a, a, a way of working the microphone, and uh, there are lots of volunteer things that you can take part in. If you have friends that are uh, artists and they draw, you can record some stuff and just put it behind their drawings, you know, it, and, and just create some of your own things. Uh, there's lots of things that you can do to get experience uh, just make sure that if you start putting your demo out there for Disney to hear, make sure that you're good enough for Disney to hire you. You know what I mean? It's a very long answer, but... Uh... Kari, would you please consider doing an animated reboot of Laverne and Shirley with you as Shirley and Gray as Laverne? Well, I would, I would do that in a second, and Gray is very, very talented, so yeah, I think we'd have a lot of fun doing that. And, and have you ever met such none of the actor who voices Mad Dark on Dexter's Lab? Who did that one? I can't remember. Oh, Eddie Beeson. Oh gosh, you know, I don't know if I've met Eddie. I know I've met a lot of other actors from that show, but I don't think I've met Eddie. But did you do any voices on Adventure Time? Adventure Time, no. I did some for the regular show. I did some for Clarence and a lot of other cartoons, but not that one. So. How many more should I ask? I, I need to get other people's questions. Thank you. Oh, we've got one over here. This is... I'm going to get you, I swear. You with the wig. It's going to happen. Hey. Hi. Yeah. Um, I'm going to make this really quick. What was it like, you know, com coming back for Devil May Cry 4 and doing Devil May Cry, doing special edition, but not coming back for Devil May Cry 5, which personally my, my friend Sean had corrected me on that because it was a non-manual review. Yeah, 
you know, sometimes that happens. Um, it's People will ask me sometimes, how come you did this role in, in this game and then not in the next one? Or, And what happens a lot of times is um, that a new company will take over or new people will take over. And uh, so sometimes they don't use the same cast or sometimes the union status will change and, and uh, I, I only do things that are covered by SAG. And so that was one of the things that happened with Double May Cry is that they, they went non-union for one of the next games so I couldn't come back, back and play Lady, which made me so sad because I love that character, but... Yeah, it was a great... <laughs> well, I was, I was certainly sad because I loved that role, but uh, here's hoping that if they do another one that they go union and maybe... Man, I, from your lips to the video game god's ears, we'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, first off, thank you very much. It's an honor to have you here. Aww. You're the absolute thank best you. actress in the industry, so thank you so thank much. You I'm sure so happy to have you here. Um, I, my question was, was there any experience going forward in your career that you wish you could have taken back to some of your earlier roles and implemented it? You know, that's a, a great question, and, and always, I'm, I'm, such a, I'm such a perfectionist and I want to get better, so sometimes it's hard to go back and watch things that I was doing in the beginning, uh, because I think, oh man, I could have done so much, uh, so much better work now. But the thing is, that's how you learn, you know? You can only get better by doing something, and so uh, I, I look back at stuff and I think, well, that's where I was at at that point in my career and um, it was really interesting because coming back for the FLCL sequels has been a real trip because, um, you know, that was my first role and it was about 18 years ago and um, so I went back and I re-watched uh, the first FLCL and it was kind of cool because in some ways, I think it was really great that I didn't have an ex any experience because I went in with no expectations and I was just really learning on the job. And so it kind of brought this fresh, uh, you know, just this fresh set of eyes to the show. And then coming back for it, I felt a little bit more experienced and, you know, Haruko is more of a mentor in these sequels. And so it just, it was kind of coming full circle. Uh, so you do the best that you can with the jobs that you get, and uh, you know, you just hope that you can keep pushing yourself to get better. So. Uh, hello. Uh, first, Hi. I just, I just want to say uh, I'm a big fan. Well, uh, thank you. Love all your voice uh, roles in the uh, anime community, including Selty from. Uh, uh, do -ra 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 -ra. Yes. yes, I was having a hard time <laughs> pronouncing that. Um, question is, um, how, what was it like doing the uh, death screen for Rip Van Winkle in uh, Helsing Ultimate? <gasps> oh my gosh, that's a great question. That is the hardest scene I've ever done. Um, because it was, it was so intense and it just went on and on and on. Uh, Taliesin. Uh, was the director of that and you know we record those things in a really dark booth and I remember that we recorded that whole thing you know and you and you're singing uh, you're, I was singing in German and then I'm you know uh, she's just this despicable you know Nazi vampire character like just it's awful and so we did that whole scene and then Talison and I just went outside afterwards and just went that was, that was intense. I mean, it, we were both just like spent. Uh, so it's one of the most challenging things I've ever done. Uh, I've never felt so wiped out and disturbed after recording something, so. Yeah, especially when it's Alucard doing the killing. It's, it, was, it was pretty intense. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, can I ask one more question? Absolutely. Um, what was it like uh, doing the role of Jessica from Rick and Morty? It was great, and so Justin Roiland that, that uh, helped create the show and everything, he and I worked on Fish Hooks, 
for, for Disney. Yeah, it was a really fun show. And so when he was creating this little show that nobody knew about, he asked, you know, he sent me the audition for it and stuff like that. So uh, it was really fun. You, you know, I got cast and I did it and it was, it was a Hello, everybody. And Matt Hill's biggest fan here. <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> my biggest question is about the voice acting industry is when you get a role, do you, is it a mixed bag when you audition or do they automatically pick you? Oh, well, you always audition. I mean, every once in a great while, uh, you know, you get a reputation and people will say, hey, just come in for this role. But 99% of the time, we still have to audition for things. Uh, so I may be doing, you know, dozens and dozens of auditions a week and hopefully if one or two of those turn into a booking then it's uh you know a lucky thing so we're always auditioning yeah uh, and one last question uh what are some of your favorite lines as uh, nova from the monkey team and tayuya from naruto oh man for for nova the whole boom boom wake up that was her little chant i loved that one and Tayuya, I was always sad with Tayuya because uh, in the original Japanese, she's much more uh, uh, dirty. And so <laughs> they had to actually censor a lot of her language for the, Ang for the English translation to make sure that they could air it on TV. So uh, she had some, some really great lines that unfortunately we, we never were able to air. <laughs> All right, so I'm starting to see a lot more people raising their hands for questions, so if we can just keep, please keep it to one question per, and if we have time at the end, we can come back around to people. Um, so, Uli Kuli was actually the first anime I ever touched, so it holds a really special place in my heart as being one of my favorites, and to see you do Haruko was a huge thing, and I want to get your take on what you felt as a character when you were doing Haruko? Uh, the first time around, I felt um, really scared because I had never done the dubbing process before. And, you know, here's this crazy character and I, I don't know if, at any second what she's going to say or do and I'm trying to learn, and you know, the, the clients from Japan were there with us, so I, it, it's kind of, it's almost sort of fitting in a way, because I was just sort of overwhelmed and trying to figure out what I was doing that first time, and there are a lot of those themes in FLCL of just trying to find yourself, you know, and figure out what you're doing, and so, it, it was just such an amazing learning experience for me. And I remember uh, one of the, Stephanie Shea worked on that as well. And she said, oh my gosh, you know, the fans are gonna love you. And I said, we have fans? There are fans for this? Like, I didn't even know that there was a world of, of anime, you know? And so it's been such, a, such an amazing ride all these years. So when they, and, and over the years, people would always say, hey, is there gonna be a sequel? And after 13 years, you're like, dude, let it go. There's never gonna be, <laughs> there's never gonna be a sequel. They're not gonna do another one. But then, it, you know, they called me up last year and they're like, if we did a sequel, would you come back for it? And I said, uh, yeah. So to come back and do this role again, all these years later, was so, it was almost emotional because, you know, not only do I look at playing that role of Haruko and it feels like kind of putting on this really comfortable old sweater, like it feels right, but I also think of all the things that changed in my life since then and how much I've grown and stuff like that. And it's, uh, it's really crazy to come back and, and play that character. So it's, it's been a huge part of my life and, and playing that character has meant a lot to me over the years. So. I like your bone, Kuli Kuli. Uh, what was your favorite line from doing Kuli Kuli? Kitty, kitty, meow. It's always kitty, kitty, meow. <laughs> and I also love, uh, it takes an idiot to do cool things. That's what makes it cool.
Hi. Um, um, so, did they, did Capcom ask you back for a Devil May Cry 5? Any chance? To... They went, they went to different union status with it. I, I think for, for one of the games, or they might have done a, a short limited series or something, they asked me if I could, and, and I was like, well, if it's non-union, I can't. And then they went on and did another title and, you know, went a different direction, so. <laughs> Hello, this is Gary. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I am a really big fan of Devil May Cry. I really enjoyed your work. Oh, thank you. Uh, secondly, I also, uh, someone took my first question, which was, how do you feel about the translation of Tayuya from Japanese to English? <laughs> as a lot of things. But I guess I'll go with a different question is, uh, compared to the names of the cast of the actual Kung Fu Panda movie, Angelina Jolie, Jack Black, Seth Rogen, how did all the voice actors cast like feel playing characters uh, in the animated cartoon who were previously voiced by such juggernauts in the names of acting? That's a great question. Um, it's it's always interesting when you're in a situation uh, where it's something that's already been created by you know a celebrity uh, because it gets into voice matching. And it's hysterical because the guy that played Poe in our series, his name is Mick Wingert, and he's just such a dead-on ringer for Jack Black that Jack Black's kids think that he did the voice in the TV series. And one of my friends ran into Jack Black, and Jack Black's like, nah, I, just, I didn't tell him. They just think it's me, you know? Because <laughs> Mick Wingert sounds so much like him. So it was interesting for me it came down to me and one other girl for the role of Tigress. And apparently the other girl sounded just a little bit more like Angelina Jolie, but they thought that I was funnier and they wanted to bring a little bit more humor into the role of Tigress for the TV series. So, so it's tricky because you're trying, to, um, you're trying to capture the same character as the movies while still adding your own spin as an actor to the part. So, and I think for the TV series, we all kind of did a, a pretty good job of, of finding that. And, and I met some of my best friends on that show that are still my closest friends to this day. So it's a great experience. Hi. Oh, this is loud. Um, <laughs> what was your experiences uh, for voice acting for Ash and Aaron Air Highland? That's a great question. Um, so I was I was really excited to be part of Final Fantasy because it's such a huge franchise, and I think now I've I've been part of maybe five of the games, four maybe, uh, yeah, something like that. But Ash was my first one, and the interesting story behind that was we did a day of recording, and I was recording that part, and then after that. You know, I always tell people training is so important. You know, being the best actor you can try to be is so important. And after our first recording session, I had started a Shakespeare class. And um, so I started the Shakespeare class, and then I, I was booked for another session for Final Fantasy XII, and I went back, and we started recording, and they said, listen, I don't know what you've done, but you're tapping into the, the royalty of this character so much more. Uh, we're going to go back and re-record everything that we did the first session. And I told them later, well, I started taking a Shakespeare class, and they said, keep taking it. Keep taking it, because it brought this elevated thing to Ash's character that seemed to go well. Um, and then with Aranea, oh, I just, I wish she would have been a bigger part of the game just because I loved that character. And I'm such a, I don't know, I'm usually a pretty, you know, nice person, I guess, in my day-to-day -day life. So whenever you get to play, just, it would be my honor if you would just step on me and take a picture. And I'm like, this is the best thing that's ever happened in my life. So I'm like getting up and I'm like... You know, so uh, so I love getting to play characters like that. It's so much fun, uh, and and just to be a part of that franchise is crazy cool. Uh, hi. Um, so, um, who do you think was the best protagonist in uh, Bully Cooling? 
Oh gosh. Oh gosh. That's 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 a really hard one to answer um, because they're all. First of all, who's the protagonist? You know what I mean? There's so many different characters, and you could argue, well, is anybody straight up good or straight up bad in that show? But I don't know. Hidomi is pretty sweet in the in the sequel, and but Naoto was so great, and uh, yeah, I, it's hard to pick. Just a moment. So, how often do you get to see art from some of the non, uh, the, the foreign language pro projects you get done? Like you mentioned that uh, they showed you a videotape of uh, Kuri Kuri, but like for the other projects, how often do you get to see artwork for it, like art books or other associated merchandise? Um, after the fact, usually I get to see a lot just because people bring it to conventions or you get to meet people at conventions that worked on the original ones and that's always really cool. But going into the projects, um, a lot of times we show up and we've, we've never gotten to read the script beforehand uh, unless you're really given a heads up. You, you've not gotten to see the, the original anime in Japanese. So that's another thing, like if you're interested in being a voice actor, being able to cold read is super important. Uh, and being able to make acting choices on the spot is, is really important because a lot of times you don't get to see the source material before you start working on it. But the thing that's so, the thing that was really cool about the FLCL sequels is, is that they were creating them in Japan and in the US at the same time. So we recorded it all out of order, season two and three, because it was just in various stages of being done. So sometimes we would record something and we would just get to see the, the thumbnail sketches. Or sometimes we would see uh, you know, partially animated parts of it and other parts would not be done, but there'd be little notes written in about what they were gonna do. So that was really cool because we got to be a little bit more of the process of putting it all together, which is neat. Just real quick, are you single? Am I single? I uh, yes. <laughs> uh, wow, that's my first time, I guess, being asked that at a convention. That's so funny. <laughs> yes, I am. Oh. Blushing now. Oh, hi again. I uh, just want to ask uh, another two questions. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I wanted to. Okay. Uh, the question I wanted to ask was, what was it like? Uh, voicing Celty from Dundura who like didn't have a head but was talking through texting so like when yeah. you were portraying her voicing her was it were you feeling a similarity where it's like you're using your voice and talking but people don't see you but they you know they hear your voice that's actually I've gotten asked that at other conventions and it's a great question um, it was really freeing to play Celty because uh, you know, anime is so technical, and you're, you're having to sync every single line up to a pre-existing picture from, from Japanese. So, you know, if the character's mouth goes, you can't say, I love you, I've always loved you, and I never love anyone else the way I've loved you. You have to make it fit into those mouth flaps. Well, with Selty, because she has no head, there was no mouth flap. So, I had a little bit more freedom to interpret the lines the way that I wanted to. So if I wanted to take like an extra tiny bit of a pause in a line, or if I wanted to slow down a line, as long as it fit within a certain amount of seconds, I had a little bit more freedom than usual to, uh, to make that character my own, which was nice. Hi, so I was wondering, is there any character that you want to play in the future? Most any of them. <laughs> Yeah, no, I just want to keep working, you know? I, I can't say that there's one part that, uh, that I think, oh gosh, I really want to do that one. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm kind of a big comic book nerd, so uh, there are definitely di different superheroes that I would still love to, love to play, or, you know, anytime I get to do something in the DC or the Marvel universe, I'm always really stoked and stuff. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I just... 
sometimes the ones that you don't know about are the ones that end up being the most fun, you know? Well, hi, Karin. Um, hi. I just wanted to say that you're super great, and I really love your work. Thank you. Um, a couple days ago, I saw a little bit of the video you, uh, the video you posted on Instagram of you doing something with Joel Quism. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Like, I, just, I saw a little video and I was like, whoa, that's so cool. And I was thank just wondering, um, like, do you miss doing that at all? That's it. Thank you so much for watching, by the way. Yeah. Uh, I did ventriloquism professionally. I taught myself when I was uh, 10 years old, and I did it for like 14 or 15 years. And uh, I just got, it's so funny, I just got really burned out on it. And so Danny, my, my little puppet, uh, is still in this little suitcase in my closet. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, someday I could see myself maybe picking it up and doing it again. It's, it's just, yeah, I just did it for so long. Uh, but it's been, it's been incredible. People have been watching that video. If, if anybody wants to follow me, by the way, on uh, social media, I'm on Twitter, at Kari Walgren. And I'm on Instagram at Kari underline Walgren. And it's W-A-H-L-G-R-E-N. And yes, there is a ventriloquism video uh, on Instagram right now. So if that's not an incentive to follow me on Instagram, then uh, I, I got nothing for you. <laughs> uh, again, thank you so much for um, being here. My uh, other question was- Wave you your hand, where are you? Where are you? Oh. oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah, wait, wait again. Uh, <laughs> Um, when you did Blood Plus, you did the unique distinction of that you were the primary protagonist yeah. and antagonist at the same time. Yeah. And uh, several episodes, all majority of the conversation was you talking to you. Uh, how was that? Um, like, how did that change how you went into the role or how you performed for it? That's a great question. Uh, for starters, I did not know that I was going to play D.Va. Uh, they didn't tell me. And uh, so I was playing Saya, the protagonist, and then it gets up to this this um, episode, and they're like, okay, so uh, you're playing Diva? And I was like, oh, oh, okay. And then I didn't realize how big a part Diva was. So I thought, well, maybe she's just got like a few lines, maybe she's just in one episode, and then holy cow, it turns into this thing where she's a major part. Uh, and, that's, that's one of those really challenging things about voiceover uh, because you have to create characters that are distinct enough that if you have entire conversations with yourself, uh, you've got to be able to be convincing as two different people. So that was a really challenging uh, project for me because First of all, I had no idea that I was going to do D.Va, and then to find out what a big role it was and how much they would interact together, it just became very important to really find ways to make them distinct and, uh, you know, talk about tapping into your good and evil sides. I mean, it's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of conflict. Lots of, lots of crazy. Hi, Kari Fari. Hi. Um, First of all, I've been a Final Fantasy person, a fan for since as long as I remember. Oh, and honestly, uh, Final Fantasy XV is by far. It will, I I wasn't really expecting a lot from it, but after like beating RNA as the character, like I just I went back into just loving Final Fantasy even more. Thank you. Um, my question specifically is, uh, what is your favorite line? Hey, from pretty boy. <laughs> it's definitely like how can how can there be any other? Just the hate from the book. Yeah. That's that's definitely my favorite. It gives me chills. <laughs> yes. Hi, uh, Kari. Okay. There we go. Sorry, guys, there, there's like this blinding light, so just bear with me if I look and try to find you. Uh, you, you had a, a comment in the beginning of the talk where you said you, you had a, I think you said survivalist job. Oh, yeah, survival job. I, I'm just wondering, at what point did you not have to rely on having a survivalist job and we're able to use voice acting full time? Or are there times where you don't get enough work where you have other side jobs? It's a, that is a great question. And it's and for anybody that wants to be an artist, and, and that can be voiceover, that can be drawing, that can be anything artistic, there will be times where you have to keep a roof over your head. You've got to do something else to just survive, you know, and pay your bills while you're trying to do your art. 
and uh, I've done everything from retail jobs to uh, I was a, for a very short time a, a waitress. I was a terrible waitress. Uh, I have done desk jobs. I've cleaned toilets in a dance studio. Like you know, you just if you if art is important to you you have to just have such a passion that you're willing to do other things to keep going until that starts paying the bills. And I was working a desk job, and um, it got to the point where I was booking some voiceover work, and so I was having to cut down the number of days a week that I worked at that desk job. And so it got to the point where I was working voiceover jobs almost you know, multiple times a week, almost every day, and then every other day I was working the desk job. And the girl who was my boss said, if you do not quit and go for this, I am going to fire you. Because she believed in me that much. And so there just comes this moment where it's a leap of faith. And, and there's no shame of if you make that leap of faith and then you go through kind of a dry spell, because, you know, artistic careers go like this. Uh, there's no shame in picking up side jobs when things are not going as well. Uh, but yeah, at that time, uh, she said, you quit or I'm gonna fire you. So I quit and knock on wood, knock on all kinds of wood, um, uh, the voiceover and on camera and stuff has, has kept me going since then. So what are, uh... What was your favorite thing doing the Fate series and some of your favorite lines? Say, say that one more time. The Fate series and your favorite lines. Excalibur! I mean, how can you not just want to say that? That was, that was my favorite. Every time, I, I have goosebumps doing it right now. Like, every time Saber would, you know, whip out the invisible sword and just be like saying that. And then, are you worthy to be my master? I mean, just gives you all the feels, you know? Ah. It's too good. Um, uh, if any, you could change anything about your voice acting career, what would it be? If I could change <laughs> anything. Like, uh, not really as in like a bad thing or a good thing, just like if you, if you had taken different turns at different times in your life, what would it be? You know what? It, it may sound weird, but I don't think I would change anything. Um, because even if there were things that weren't great, like, you know, I've lost roles, or I've uh, done roles and I've watched them back years later and thought, oh, that could have been better, but every single thing I've learned something from, and that's the, I don't know, that's the, that's the one piece of advice, life advice, no matter what you guys are doing, uh, is to reframe that idea of failure. Failure, it's, there's not really any such thing as failure, it's just another step towards finding a way to success, you know? So, so if something doesn't work out or if, if you do something and it didn't turn out so well or, you know, you don't get this job or, uh, it just, I don't know that I would change anything because everything that's happened in my career has, has been, you know, it's, I don't know, it's gotten me here and that's not such a bad place to be, so. Hi, I love your costume. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we are just fangirling over here because we didn't realize that you did Saya and Eva in oh, one class. Yes. Um, but <laughs> I had a question, if it's okay, she has a separate question. Sure. Um, we wanted to ask uh, if you like doing Saya better or if you like voicing Eva better. Oh. Okay, well, it's a, t it's a tough call, but I am going to say Saya. And I, I had my hair short for a long time, kind of in that Saya haircut. And so people would always ask me, if you could cosplay as one of your characters, who would it be? And for years, when I had that short haircut, it was Saya. I was like, give me the red contact lenses and a big ass sword. And, uh, and that's what I, yeah. There was just something about Saya just on a lot of levels that I was just like, ah, uh, yes. Uh, and you know, Diva, She's a disturbing character. There were a couple scenes with her that were hard to record. 
because she was just so unlikable. Uh, but of course, that's so much fun to do. I just wanted to say thanks. Yeah, you voiced so many of my favorite female oh, characters, and I was you. wondering which character uh, that you played was your favorite. Oh gosh, it's always hard to pick a favorite. Um, it's hard to pick a favorite, like, but I, I definitely have ones that I have loved playing. I, I loved Fu in Samurai Champloo. I love that she loves to eat because I love to eat. I mean, whenever she would turn into fat Fu after eating too much, I'm like, girl, that's what I do after I eat a large pizza. I'm like, ho, 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 you know? I'm like, yes. Uh, and, and Kagami and Lucky Star, like, she's such the, you know, little brainy, do gooder. It reminded me a lot of myself in junior high. So, you know, and Haruko's obviously such a sentimental favorite. So I have a lot of favorites and, and lots of little moments from certain characters that I, I can kind of see myself in, which is nice. Uh oh, is it on? Uh, hi. Hi. Um, what was the hardest line to record as Haruko? Oh my gosh. Well, in the original, they have about 16 outtakes of me trying to say my full name for the first time. It's like, I, it took me forever to Haru, Hara, Haruko. But there's like this, these outtakes of me saying it about 60 times and, and messing it up. So that was really hard in the beginning. But man, with the sequels, the rap. I don't know if anybody's seen the rap yet. I saw that, it was funny. Uh, we did so many takes of that. And, and the crazy thing is, is that you're trying to not only get all the rhythms right, but you're trying to translate it from Japanese into English and make it work out timing-wise and everything. So uh, that was, we took a lot of time with that rap. Just, just because I wanted it to be as good as it could be. So I was, I was pulling a little bit of influences from like Nicki Minaj and Snoop Dogg and a little TLC. So yeah, it was, that was challenging. Thank you. I love Lori. your costume. You're amazing. <laughs> I want to ask, how do you, you go for like a cold read where you're not real sure who you're going to be voicing or like, how do you get into character for that character? Like, um, if you have no idea what the personality is, how do you then um, adjust your voice and your tone, mannerisms, and all that to fit that character? Well, usually, when you're when you're doing an audition for a character, um, they'll at least give you something. They'll give you a maybe a little picture. Uh, maybe they'll give you a breakdown. This character is 15 to 17 years old, very shy. Uh, you know, doesn't feel like she gets along with her classmates, whatever. Uh, and then with your cold reading skills, you know, they may give you some sides and you'll read through it and then you take clues from the script, like does this character talk a lot? Does this character stutter? Um, you kind of just take clues from whatever you're given. And if you, if you get into the session and you don't have any of that, that's when you really, uh, are so lucky if you have a great director because the voiceover directors will know what's going on in a scene in a show uh, you know they're they're gonna they're gonna be the ones that tell you you know what don't talk sexy to him because about six episodes from now you're gonna find out he's your brother so you know oh I didn't know that but I'm glad the voice director did because you know I didn't have that context so you, you kind of make the best choices you can from what you're given, and then in the, in the recording sessions, you'll always have people that are helping you out with it. Hey, Life, do you ever use your character voices? <laughs> I, I do in my car a lot. Uh, I, I sing in the car in, in my character voices. Uh, there's a video that went slightly viral of me singing Marilyn Manson in the car. Uh, and I was singing it as this little, cute little girl character. I think it's on Instagram too. Uh, and uh, when I talk to my cats, I'm sorry, like I try not to be one of those cat ladies that talks to the kitties in a voice, 
but they're just delicious. And so then I just find myself, yeah, you little guy, you're going to take me on to the feed you. Yeah. Come here, you little muffin. Yeah, like I can't, I'm sorry. I lose respect for myself, but I count. Hi. I just want to say it's an honor to meet you. First, this would be a little embarrassing for me. Um, Haru Haru Haruko was actually my first anime crush. Aww. Thank you. And um, I also want to ask, um, because you said you cosplay, you'd, if you had a chance, you'd cosplay as one of your characters that you've done. Um, have you ever thought about cosplaying as any of your other characters? Because you look like you could be the spitting, spitting image of both Haru Haru Haruko as well as a, sh a Shelly pornographer mask. <laughs> you know, I if I had a dollar for every time somebody asked me to cosplay Haruko, I could probably buy an island somewhere and just... <laughs> um, I never have cosplayed as one of my characters. Uh, but, yeah, for a long time I had the Haruko hair with the kind of like little flip out to the side and stuff, so, I don't know, maybe someday, maybe, maybe someday I'll make that happen. Hey, um, is there going to be a season four Rick and Morty? Uh, gosh, a season four Rick and Morty. Yes. Um, I, I know that they did get picked up for some more episodes, but that's all the info I can Oh, I see somebody down here in the front. Yes, I'm coming. I'm coming. You're getting your work out in here. Of course. Finally, I just have to interview the character that the most difficult for a voice actor is comfortable. Like, is there a fully fully one or the non-Japanese one? Uh, it, which character is the most difficult? Yes, any character. Oh gosh, well, Haruko's a difficult one just because she's all over the place, like she's, she's, you know, sometimes she's crazy, sometimes she's tender, uh, sometimes she's funny, um, uh, and then there are just some that are vocally harder to do, like some of the video games, we have pages and pages and pages of, of, of screams and uh, death reactions, so you know, you have to be really careful with your voice on some of those. Um, you know, you'll you'll have like 90 lines saying, getting punched in the face, getting punched in the stomach, getting, you know, punched harder, uh, big kick, small kick, small punch, medium punch, like, and you'll just have like pages and pages of that. So those can be really challenging too, just from a, from a vocal standpoint. Okay, so we have 10 minutes left. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question who has not yet had the opportunity to ask a question before we go and, and let people ask uh, additional? You've already asked one. I'm, ch I'm checking to see if there are people who have not I don't think this gentleman I don't think he has either, so we'll go over here. Hi. Hi. Thank you for being here. And um, so I'll start by saying um, full, fully Rick and Morty. Great shows, done a wonderful job uh, for doing other shows. How, and uh, Rob Paulson uh, interview, such a great interview. Thank you so it was much. So much fun uh, listening and watching that. And then, um, do you have any future projects that you can talk about? That's a great question. Um, I have to go through my list of NDAs. <laughs> uh, okay, I can't. Nah. Ye. Actually, everything that I'm working on right now, I pretty much can't talk about, <laughs> can't talk about yet. But it, it is another reason to uh, follow on social media if you're not already, because there are a couple things that I'm so super close to being able to announce, and I'm very excited about them. So, uh, yeah. So there's a number of new things in the work. I, I just can't quite say them yet. Okay. Have you thought about doing live action roles? At all? I've done some live oh. action. Uh, I, I did uh, a few episodes of Wizards of Waverly Place, and I've done Criminal Minds and some commercials and things like that. Uh, it's just hard right now because, uh, knock on wood, I'm, I'm doing so much voiceover work that scheduling-wise, I'm not really available as much to go and do the auditions for on camera and then, you know, you're on set all day for a TV show when you could be doing like three voiceover sessions. So it's it's tricky because time-wise, I just haven't found a way to juggle both. But I'd, I'd love to do more. 
and I, um, my friends and I, we just did a concert, a stage concert, uh, about a week ago. That went very well, so we're going to be uh, doing another one in February, and so maybe we'll start, you know, being able to do a little bit more singing and concert shows as well. So we'll see. Well, looking forward to your future work. Thank you. And uh, autographs and pictures after the Q and A. Yes, we. Uh, there is an autograph signing at 4 p.m. I think in the autographs uh, section. So I can't do any like right after this panel. But if you come and see me at 4 p.m., I'm going to be there. And then I'm also doing another signing and a couple of panels tomorrow. And you can catch me after those. And uh, uh, yeah, I'll be around all weekend. So definitely come by. All right, is there anyone else who has not yet asked a question that would like to ask one? Hi, Kari. Hi. Um, I know when you guys get characters, sometimes the whole show has been done in Japan, and you have the ability you can research your character after you find out who you're cast. Have you ever done research on characters so that you know more yourself, or do you just rely on what the director's giving you for your prompts? That's a great question. Um, I have had the opportunity to do that more with uh, US animation. Um, and I always love to say, yeah, I'm doing research because I have to do research and not because I just love reading X-Men comic books. You know, when I got the role of Emma Frost uh, in Wolverine and the X-Men, like I, I was really nervous about that one because I love the X-Men, but it gave me a chance to go back and like reread a, a lot of the source material about her. Um, same thing with, uh, we did uh, Legion of Superheroes, and I played Saturn Girl, so I wasn't really as familiar with that comic book, so I got a chance to go back and read some of that, and, and I came back and played her again in uh, one of the Lego movies. Um, so anytime there is source material like that, I, I tend to try to really look into it before we go in and record. Um, with the, with the Japanese anime projects, I usually don't get a heads up as much with those. I can say that sometimes I get a little bit more influence when we're doing the project because it's very tricky. Sometimes the way things are in the original Japanese anime doesn't translate well to a, a US audience. For example, I remember doing one game, and I was playing a, uh, a battle sergeant in her early 30s. And in the original Japanese, she sounded, And that was kind of the sound of her character. And, you know, we're, we're in the studio with the Japanese clients and with the English voice director and everything. And we had to have a big discussion about, well, an American audience won't buy that a battle combat leader in her early 30s sounds like that and acts like that. So we had to kind of have this conversation and come to an understanding about creating that character in a way that would be believable to a Western audience. So I think that, you know, when I ended up doing her character, she sounded tougher and more like this and stronger and we kind of made her more believable as, you know, a sergeant. Uh, so sometimes you do have a, some input into how that character is created and translated over into, uh, you know, the U.S. audience. So I don't know if that answers, hopefully it answers your question a little bit. All right, so we have time for one more question, Mr. Oman. Great t-shirt, by the way. Thanks. Um, actually, it's not really a question, uh, but at the beginning of the month, Crunchyroll Expo was in San Jose, and they had a Puri Puri panel for the sequels where they were giving these shirts out. Nice. And uh, on stage, Stephanie and them, they said that one of the career highlights was discovering you. Oh, that's so sweet. I love Stephanie. She's she's uh, the first person that took a chance on me in the business, and she's now one of my dearest friends. So I can't say enough good things about her. All right, well, you guys, thank you so much for coming. Uh, come to the signing today if you want at four, and I'll, I'll be doing some more panels tomorrow. I don't have the schedule right in front of me, but thank you guys, and I'll see you soon.